This is not re reality. This is the real deal. 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 So how do you accomplish something you've never done before? I mean something big, like becoming a music star, producer, engineer, lawyer, executive, or anything else in life. Who holds the key to that kind of success in an ever-changing world of challenges? I learned my craft from trial and error and by embracing various mentors. I got the real deal on all I needed to know from those that had succeeded before me. I am Doug, and this is the real deal on the entertainment industry. Coming up. Rock icon D. Snyder, guitarist Al Petrelli, entertainment attorney Ed Grauer, artist and songwriter Jive Jones, and chief studio technician Mike Donahauer. Together, we'll explore the real deal on their lives and their experiences. This is the real deal. 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 Right on. So we have the distinct honor today of a man who has been somewhat of a mentor of mine. We've known each other for over 10 years. He sold over 10 million records worldwide, and now you see him quite a bit on VH1 and other stations, as well as movies and on radio. I'm honored to call him friend. Mr. D. Snyder. So how did you get into this wacky, crazy business? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, we're, we're talking obviously about the music business, and uh, it's, uh, it really comes from a deep-seated star being uh, starvation for attention. You know, uh, the oldest of six kids, and uh, my, it was back in the day when women had them like they were twins, you know, <laughs> consecutive, you know, sex tuplets or something. Year after year after year, you kept giving birth to another one. And being the oldest, I quickly was pushed aside and said, you can feed yourself. <laughs> your, your siblings need help. Um, and it was really, uh, I didn't even see the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. I, my father had banned TV in our house that year. <laughs> Which is a whole other story. He just decided, no TV. We're going to get back to reading books and building puzzles, you know. And so it was like, you know, we were living in a log cabin or something. I'm, I'm just glad we had electricity. <laughs> the, uh, we, I came to the bus stop, I guess it was third grade, or 1964, you know, and um, everybody was buzzing. And I said, what's going on? They said, oh, you see the Beatles last night on the Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan show. And I said, oh, what, what's a Beatle? And they said, yeah. it's a rock band. You know, and he said, uh, everybody was screaming. And the minute I heard the phrase, everybody was screaming, uh, and I remember clear as a bell saying, well, that's what I'm going to be. And I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, I'm going to be a Beatle. <laughs> and then I found out quickly that you couldn't be a Beatle. You could be, you know, uh, you know, in a rock band. But my sole motivation for becoming a rock star was the idea that I got all this attention and everybody was focused on you. And so it's all based on my, on my psychoses. And uh, thanks, Mom and Dad. Yeah. Well, you're feeling much better now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of my favorite things, Doug, is that is, you know, my father often likes to take credit for my success, saying that if it wasn't so hard on me, that I wouldn't be who I am today and I wouldn't have had been driven to succeed. I said, how do you know I wouldn't be happier as a well-adjusted accountant yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> rather than a damaged rock star? But, uh, but like I said, I feel better now. Well, what type of advice would you have for people starting out now? Any sort of paths that you would recommend that uh, someone takes? I don't want to poo-poo going to school, okay? And I don't want to be a person because going to school, whether it's a, you know, a college or it's radio school or a music school or a technical school, um, and they exist out there, are great ways to learn, they're great ways to uh, find your entrance into a field, and if you don't know how else to do it, it's, it's a doorway, you know, and, and it, could lead, it will lead you down that path where you want to go. The other school of thought is the school of hard knocks, and that is to just get out there and do it. Instead of going to college, for, for, to school for four years to learn screenplay writing, just start writing screenplays, and in four years you'll have, you know, uh, you know, if you if you're resourceful and you you've uh, dug around and you've found some screenplays, you've read some books, you'll have written four, five, six, eight screenplays and in that same four years, and that people are in school writing screenplays. And meantime, you've already been, maybe you've got an agent or you've you've been to some, uh, you've shown your stuff to some people, and you've gotten some real life experience. But for some people, they are not that resourceful, and it's not to say that it's, it's useless, any of these things. Uh, the same goes for, like, broadcasting school. 
You know, there are many people who go to broadcasting school and others who just get an internship at a radio station and figure it out as they go. So uh, there's, you know, there's two ways to go there, but people should not be afraid to just dive into the thick of things and, you know, uh, put your shoulders to the grindstone, I mean, and actually work. I mean, you and I worked in a, in a recording studio where two engineers, that was before you got there, uh, one arrived uh, as just as a guy off the street saying, hey, I want to be a recording engineer. And the other guy was, came out of a, a school where he trained to be a recording engineer. And they both started as interns, and they both worked their way up the ranks, and they both today are successful engineers. I'm talking about Tom and Dan. Right. Just so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Both took very different paths to get where they're going, and they're both very good at what they do. Yeah. And for Dan, uh, and I, the listeners don't know who they are, but I'm just saying, for Dan, the right path for him, for the type of guy he was, for his personality, was to go to school. And he, that's what he needed, and, and it worked for him, for his path. And he's excellent at what he does. Tom is a looser kind of guy, a, you know, a seat of his pants kind of guy. And he just, he just came in and said, hey, I want to do this, and figured it, up, out, figured it out as he went along. No, that's how and, I did it. And that's how you did it, and it worked the same for him as well. So, you know, neither is wrong. You have to just figure out which one is more right for you. Now, have you found that through your years of experience that you've been able to let go a bit more, let the universe sort of allow opportunity to come your way, or do you find that forcing your way through things has been uh, more effective? And have any people like Tony Robbins or any of those disciplines, I know we've spoken about him, helped you in these situations? Any, any ways that that has been, uh, been helpful for you? Well, uh, the first half, uh, I was a forcer. The second half, I've been, uh, you know, I've, I've welcomed opportunities. Uh, I was, I don't think I truly lack, uh, in, in my, you know, in my early younger years, spontaneity. I always had to be more than ready. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, 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 took, it made the process a longer one for me. Uh, unwillingness to be flexible and unwillingness, I'm not saying to compromise what you believe in, but just to seize some opportunities, you know? And uh, I was very thought out, I was very methodical, and I learned, saw that as a shortcoming, you know? And as a matter of fact, when I did Tony, one of my key things was to, to become more spontaneous to, you know, to, in, in, in my daily life, whether it's with my children or in my business life, you know? And not be afraid to just grab any opportunity and, uh, and learn to say yes, and then figure it out later. You know what I mean? There's, there's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, I, you know, so that's one of the, the, the big things for me is just I learned how to say, yes, I'll do that. I'll try that. Let's go. And have you found that to be rewarding? Incredibly rewarding. Incredibly, uh, it's, it's like a weight off your shoulder. And you, you come to realize that you're capable of, of doing a lot. You have to trust your abilities. You know what I mean? And believe in your abilities. Can you share any examples of how you've been able to apply this, uh, this thought process? I mean, just yesterday, I worked with VH1 Classic. I do special um, programming with them. I'm signed. And I walked into a situation yesterday, and I looked at, and first of all, my, you know, during uh, the day, my wife goes, so you're thinking what you're going to do when you get there? No, not really. I don't really stress that anymore. I got there, I walked in, and it was a cluster F. <laughs> and I said, okay. Fix it, you know. Uh, you know you're here now. Uh, either run out and j you know, jump in front of a, mo a moving car, or you, or you make this work. And I've just learned to make it work. I don't know if uh, 30 years ago I would have been able to do the same thing. Now, mind you, I was way younger, uh, but also I just, just were very, you know, locked into uh, regimentation. Things had to be a certain way, it had to be right, or I couldn't do it. What were some of the most valuable lessons you've learned through your illustrious career, and from whom? What would be the most uh, important things you'd like to share with us? My parents tried to teach me many lessons, and there's certain ones that they did, things they did that I saw and I emulated. Those were the best lessons I learned. Uh, from them, with, with their actions, not their words. There were other things they tried to beat me over the head with to get me to think about. And um, my biggest ones have been economic. I've always been really bad with money. I'm a creative, and uh, I just uh, don't really 
think about those things or plan those things uh, and uh, you know so uh, and plan for those things and so as time's gone on especially you know as I get older and now I start thoughts of retirement and what have you uh, I realize you know I've made some major mistakes in the past economically and, and I look to change that um, but the same thing you know for a creative uh, like myself uh, you know my idea of, of putting putting something away for the future is just creating another property that's going to make money right. <laughs> so I can get a win. All right, that'll be my retirement fund. I'll, I'll, we're going to windfall off that, you know. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, we all have our strengths and we have our weaknesses, you know, and there are people there, like I've got a brother who is a cable guy, but he is so well invested and so well saved he's you know he's he's gonna retire in a in a beautiful state but meanwhile he had a very very what was the word about minimal minimalist lifestyle you know well i'm saving i'm saving i'm saving and meantime life's passing by but he's gonna have a great retirement uh, me i'm just hoping that some of these projects bring a nice windfall right well obviously the the goal would be to get a balance of that to be able to enjoy life and it yeah, absolutely is, and that's you know certainly what I'm trying to do now. You know, the the biggest one again, and I think this plays to uh, is plays to things I was talking about is I just learn to roll with things a little bit more and not be you know you know so inflexible that if something doesn't go exactly as I plan it, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. You know, readjust. You know, and make modifications. And if you know, was it said, the plan is dead. Here's to the new plan. You know, I mean, so that's just, this is our battle. Our battle cry here is, you know, we just, hey man, if something doesn't go exactly as you planned, readjust. And I, that's something I definitely did not and could not do. Uh, in the, you know, in my younger years, and now I've, I've certainly learned. Well, D, I thank you so much as ever, with Vim and Vigor. No, you know, not not just uh, just for the Vim. Can't leave the Vigor out. So next we have Al Petrelli stopping in. Um, met Al officially working on the second Widowmaker record, Stand By for Pain, which is actually when I met D. And uh, since then, he's done quite a bit, and here's some highlights. He's been with TSO, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, which some of you uh, sure have heard the. Uh, you know that one? And uh, I think it's the Carol of the Bells. And he's also spent some time with Megadeth. Uh, pretty exciting. So, um, Al, tell us about your experiences and what brought you here. It's kind of goofy. Somehow, I, you know, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, in my 20s, I, I was the antithesis of what I am now. I mean, I'm thinking that, you know, I was above it all and... You know, your ego gets crazy, and then, you know, you get a couple things that happen in your life that bring you down to earth, and you can either point the finger at other people for blame, or you could look in the mirror and say, well, you're really a jerk, you better straighten your life out, of which I chose that. Dee Snyder was very instrumental in straightening me out years ago, as you know how Dee can be. Indeed, yeah. Dee uh, rocked, and we had him on earlier. Um, he had lots to say and, and was very, very insightful. But why don't you get back to telling us how you got started into all this? Um, I'm sure that you had a long, sordid uh, experience. My career, is, she, it started out, uh, I, I guess, like everybody else, you know, cutting your teeth in the bars back in the 70s into the early 80s, um, trying to develop some sort of reputation as a, a, a hot shot or, you know, somebody, you know, worth going to see. Um, getting in certain circles of people and other uh, musicians that you want to kind of, you know, break some bread with and make some music with. But I wanted to get off Long Island. I saw the bigger picture. You know, New York City was only 42 miles away from my mother's house, but it might have been across the Atlantic. You know, it was just this mystical place, and you know, down in the village of musicians and the scene that was going on there. So I wanted to get there, but I didn't know how to. So I went to Berkeley College of Music for a little while, which, as an institution at the time, was good. But what I learned from it was um, by playing with musicians from all over the country and all over the world. There was a wealth of musical information I was not aware of. I think the most important lesson... Did you graduate Berkeley? Nah. I made it three semesters and said, okay, I'm done. <laughs> you know, so I'm going, now I'm ready to tackle New York City, you know. Mistake number 11, but whatever. <laughs> but diversity, in, in my opinion, um, or certainly in my career, has allowed me to work for 20-something years. You know, being pigeonholed or labeled as one style player, um, if, if you end up being that player, like a Slash in the Guns N' Roses or, you know, Jimmy Page in Zeppelin or whomever it may be, then you have nothing to worry about. But if you want to make a living as a musician and, you, you know, if, if you're not going to be in that next huge band that's going to set you up for life, 
you better be able to play a few different styles and learn how to read really, really well. And that's what allowed me to work as much as I do. Now, that reading and all that good stuff, did that help you with Megadeth? Or why don't you just share us your experiences with Megadeth and what that meant to you and how you got into it? That was a weird time. I was definitely backtracking, or um, I don't know if that's the right word. I was heading down um, not a, such a good path, you know, uh, drinking way too much, um, probably doing more drugs than I wanted to do, pretty miserable in my personal life, uh, a failing marriage, so on and so forth. And, um, uh, it's kind of how like the stars lined up in October of 99 I met Jane who has become my wife met her and I said you know there's a woman who's a better musician than I am <laughs> she's a better person than I am and she could out drink me <laughs> um, that's the kind of woman I'd like to spend my life with but you know she was reconciling with her ex-husband at the time great drummer named Mike Mangini who used to play with Steve I, and now he's a teacher up at Berkeley. Uh, they would try to patch things up. My, uh, my ex-wife, or at the time my wife and I were separated, was like, all right, this is kind of a drag. And Janie and I became real good friends, and she's a, a composer in a great jingle house in New York City. And we spent a lot of time together, and we were respective of each other's situations, and said, well, you know, maybe after the holidays we'll think this through, and if uh, we can get together, great. And I went on the road with TSO for the first tour in 99 and got a phone call somewhere around that time from Jimmy DeGrasso, who was the drummer in Megadeth, and said, listen, man, <clears throat> Marty Friedman uh, wants to quit, and we need somebody to finish out this leg of the tour. And it was like one of those things that you just have in the bottom of your stomach said, this is my way out. Right. You know, this is going to give me some pretty gainful employment, or more so than I was having at the time. And working for somebody like a Dave Mustaine is going to straighten your ass out really quick. That's like going to boot camp. Right. You know, so I knew Dave briefly. I'd met him a couple times, but I just, I jumped on the opportunity. And what started out as finishing the American tour, went, it was, you want to go to Japan, you want to do the record, you want to be in the band. And I said, this is my chance to clean up my act permanently, cut bait with everything on Long Island and start from scratch. So it helped me musically. I learned a lot of things, but more importantly, on a personal level, it kind of took me out of harm's way. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a tough, tough time. You know, you have to want to change, and change is the one thing that a lot of musicians, you know, because of the conversation you and I are having, uh, musicians are afraid of change. Yep. Sometimes you have to do that because complacency could kill you. Yeah, absolutely. All righty, kiddies. Now that you've become rock stars, it's time to get your business in order. Here's Ed Grauer, entertainment attorney, defining the roles of managers and lawyers. This is the real deal. deal, deal. The lawyer can act, can do similar things, and sometimes do, does similar things that managers, which is advise clients, um, artists, producers, on general sort of career strategic moves. But they can also do the specific legal work. You know, here's a contract that needs to be negotiated, or here's things like that. And also what lawyers in the music business do, which doesn't really happen in, in, in other entertainment fields and certainly doesn't always happen in other general business situations, is they will actively go out and try to get deals happening for artists. So it's called shopping a deal. Is that someone that someone specializes? Well, some there, there, are, there are attorneys who, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a specialty, but there are attorneys who do it well because they, they keep up their relationships with the A&R guys who are which is an ever-shifting uh, population, um, given you know the what's happening with the, the labels and the consolidation and new you know people getting fired and new people coming on. So you have to be really up on who's who and who can make decisions and who really can't. And then there are attorneys that really don't do that, and they only handle artists that have deals or are established. Do those guys end up being the kind that sort of end up managing sometimes and not? No, I think that when someone ends up becoming a manager, take on that role, it's probably one that where they've nurtured the client, the artist, for a long time. Um, I think that that's what happened with Britney Spears and Larry Rudolph. Which they're no longer together, right? No, they're not. But he was, you know, was working with her and got her the deal and was co-managing her with Johnny Wright, who also managed NSYNC at the time. And and then it really that became his full-time job because she was, you know, obviously a superstar. So he he stopped practicing law and and then you know managing Britney and a couple of other artists was was his full-time. So when is the best time and the best method in picking an attorney? If you don't need an attorney to shop, then you should you don't really need an attorney until you actually have a deal on the table. 
There's no reason to pay to call someone up and start the clock running, especially if they're a uh, hourly attorney, and you know have to pay a retainer until there's actually a deal. And if there's a deal on the table, trust me, you can you can have your pick. <laughs> yeah. If you want a shopping attorney, then at the same time that you're showcasing around town, you might want to call, you know, ask around and see who are the shopping attorneys in New York, like if you're in New York, and you would and start trying to invite them down to your shows, send them your, your demo, just like you would send a label. And would you say that there's a strategy to picking attorney, even if you know, let's say you're signing to Columbia or whatever, you know, label X, would it behoove someone to do some investigating to see who has good relationships there or do you think that that really think, doesn't make a difference? Well, I think the business is, I mean, that's, it's okay, but I think the business is, is, is small enough that, I mean, I have relationships in business affairs departments with every everyone at every label and especially given that the labels are consolidating so much, there's <laughs> so only like three, three or four. <laughs> so, I, I mean, uh, you know, it's like I've dealt with over the years whether they were at one time they were at other firms and now or they were at one label now they're at another label. And so I think that's true for most attorneys, you know, unless they're brand new. Um, that would come into more into play if, knock on wood, you're successful and it's time to renegotiate your deal. Then you might want to pick an that's attorney, right, who has, you know, like who has a relationship with the chairman of the whole thing. What are some of the more important lessons that you've learned that you could share with us? I have two lessons that, that come to mind, and they're not necessarily specific to lawyers, but they might be specific to the entertainment business, and they're probably specific to every business. One is, what I learned early on, was that there's always someone great around the corner. It might take you a minute to find them, not if you're an artist or a producer, but if you're an aspiring manager, or an, you know, an early, you know, a young attorney, or, or a young A&R executive, or you want to get into that role, where I was working with this art, the first artist I was working with, and I thought, I'll never find an artist like that again, a great artist like that. Well, A, he didn't turn out to be a great artist. He turned out to be a very successful songwriter. But you know what? You never know. There's always going to be someone around the corner that, that is going to be great. So everyone has the story of lo you know, losing that great artist that they were working with. And then the other um, thing is, is that there are good guys and there are good people in this business, but everyone is out for themselves. Also, if you're an artist and you, you're working with an A&R guy and they think that he's your best friend and then all of a sudden things start you know, the cracks in the relationship and the label's not supporting you the way you want or you're not getting what you want. At the end of the day, this A&R person's most important job is to keep his job and not necessarily to serve as you as an artist. And then the other side of the coin is if you're a manager, producer, even an attorney. I've gotten fired by clients. You know, the artists are egocentric, whatever. They're artists. And if you get fired or get, you think that this guy's your best friend, you guys are going to be together for your whole careers, it's very unlikely, and they're looking out for themselves, and you should look out for yourself as well. It's not all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I wanted to explore other opportunities in the entertainment industry, so I caught up with Mike Donahauer, chief technician at a major recording studio, on how he chose his rewarding path. Well, first I was interested in audio engineering, actually being the person who recorded and mixed music, but I I soon discovered that that I was not a patient person in that way where I could sit and and listen critically and and manipulate and create a sound to have a vision an end vision in music that that I had to achieve in a mix I had a self-taught background in electronics and luckily in my first studio internship discovered that there was someone there who behind the scenes worked on the equipment, kept it clean, repaired any problems, and also installed new equipment. And that job just that just clicked with me. It was perfect for my personality. So what advice would you have for anyone starting out based on your experiences and, and how you were able to figure out what really spoke to you? I I think it, it has to come first from an internal motivation. It really, it's, uh, it's reflection. What, what do you enjoy doing? I, I spoke to a, a high school student who was here the other day. It was a one-day internship. And I, I asked him, well, so what, do you, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? And he couldn't really identify anything specifically except that he liked to... Uh, to uh, chat online and play video games. <laughs> and 
he he wasn't a musical person. He was kind of thrust into this internship by the school. But I was trying. I was just trying to to impress upon him that that the the most joy you'll have in a career is something that that comes from within. When you really look at what you enjoy doing, uh, and and then take it from there. I'm not a I'm not a very good salesman, so I just would never ever be able to sit at a desk and just uh, place cold calls all day trying to get people to invest in a, a mutual fund or to uh, to get their chimneys cleaned. Uh, I would never be able to do that. It would have to come from from uh, some sort of internal motiv- motivation. If I wanted to change and I saw that that, that, that change was really something that I enjoyed, then, uh, then nothing would stop me. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Wonderful words of advice, and uh, I believe we all can relate to that. Next, we have Jive Jones, a great friend of mine. Uh, he's an artist, producer, songwriter. Some of the songs you would know of his, Candy, that Mandy Moore performed, Cowboys and Kisses, that Anastasia performed. And I recently caught up with him, and let's discover a little bit on how he got into this. We all have different methods that we got there, and perhaps uh, Jive will be able to share with you some interesting perspectives. This is The Real Deal. I believe you had a deal, With right? The Cure. With The Cure has a publishing company called Fiction Song, so um, they gave me a very small amount of money, but it was enough money for me not to work in clubs anymore in Miami, so I decided to, you know, pop up here in New York and try to make it. And then when I, I came up here, they hooked me up with uh, Rick Wake, who was just um, really big producer, he produced a lot of pop acts, Mariah, etc. cetera. I mean, so uh, I, I went in there and really, that's where I really cut my teeth and that's how I got started. Is like I went into that camp as, you know, a, a, an aspiring producer slash writer masquerading, but I really was an artist. The artistry was not in discussion? Well, it, it was, and I was, but I was using the money from the productions to get my artist thing going, because nobody really was like into my artist project yet, so they were like, oh, we need songs, we need songs, and I had lots of songs, and I, I, it was really easy for me, so I took that, and then, um, you know, took the money from that to uh, further my solo career. Was that always what you wanted to do, be like, no. when you were a kid? <laughs> I didn't even know what songwriting was. I learned all that when I got here, but um, I just wanted to be, I'm not, you know, I've always been into my artist project, but when I came up here and people were like, you know, we'll give you this much money to write this song for this person, I was like, you know, I got to do it, you know, and I, I really learned, uh, I had a hidden talent for writing songs and production, but I definitely, it was a lot, you know, when you're in New York, uh, subsistence is, is, is the, their main goal, so I think that in trying to keep myself in New York, I was just really taking any gig I could. If it was songwriting, if it was singing background, doing jingles, whatever. If you were over there at Dream Factory, so then they were into everything. So we right. would just work as much as we could. And a good thing about that Dream Factory was that a lot of the guys there were older guys. So but come seven o'clock, they'd leave. And if you remember, we, you and me would stay till like yep. the next morning. Yep. And that's how we got over on the other, the, the older guys, is because they just wanted to live their lifestyle. And okay, seven, I'm going home. And they allowed us to stay, and we just like really learned, you know, and honed our craft on the, the after hours. So, what lessons have you learned through your uh, illustrious career, as it were? The biggest lesson what is is that when you're the small guy, you're the small guy, and there's no way around it. I don't care if you wrote. Smells like teen spirit. You know, you're gonna have to kind of suck it up because everybody's gonna capitalize on it, and they're not gonna allow you to. If you really buckle down and use that opportunity, use all the opportunities, because that's the word you're gonna hear all the time. This is a great opportunity for you. This is opportunity, and this is promotion. And you're gonna hear all these words, and you get really mad, and you're like, you know, I want to get paid. I want to get paid. But if you really don't focus on that and just like utilize the opportunities, you can get through it. Because, like I said, I, I when I had a couple of hits, it was. I, I thought it was just going to be a totally different world out there, and it was just like I was in the exact same place but with hits. Those hits being Candy, uh, Mandy Moore, and Anastasia with uh, Cowboys and Kisses. Yep. I didn't. I didn't really have any more money. I just had more access to people that could get my career further, and that's what it's really about. And before I knew it, I was too. I was big enough to to fight them. I can't sue them for. They owe me two hundred thousand dollars. I can't sue them for two hundred thousand dollars if it cost me two hundred thousand right. dollars. So they get you in this weird kind of thing but you don't focus on that just focus on the work and be passionate about the work that's that's the lesson I learned you know everything else will work itself out if you if your work is awesome eventually you know they'll have to give you the credit they'll have to give you the points and you know you'll you'll be standing up there with one of those little 
megaphone things right. called Grammys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thanking you very much, Jive. Alrighty, friends, let's catch up here. We certainly had a lot of experiences thrust upon us indeed. So what did you find out? How does any of this apply to you? Only you can answer that. So um, let me just offer you some of my thoughts here. We learned that D wanted to be a Beatle. More importantly, he realized what excited him about being a Beatle. He was driven by getting attention just like the Beatles got. People were screaming and that's what excited him. He knew what he wanted. He just may not have realized it consciously that he knew why. He learned that although being in complete control and forcing stuff, he also realized as he got older that letting stuff happen and, and embracing those challenges and conquering them was perhaps more rewarding than was before. We also discovered that uh, he may have liked to have been a well-adjusted accountant instead of a rock god. Uh, but then we would have missed out on a lot of fun. We met Al Petrelli and he discovered that there's plenty of work and opportunity as a session musician as well as on stage if you master your craft. We discovered that if we can overcome some demons, we can still rock. Ed Grauer shared with us some tips and ideas about the legal system and entertainment. He clarified some issues regarding management and legal representation as well as how and when to pick an attorney. And he gave us some faith that there's still always opportunity out there for us to, to not get too despondent when we feel like we've missed something. Mike D shared a wonderful gift on how he discovered his path, how he tried one job and realized that it just didn't gel with him, it just didn't work. He did have enough self-awareness to recognize what his passion was when he saw it and he felt it, and he just went for it, which is amazing, and this is what we should do. You know, enjoy. Jive gave his great perspective on focus. He shared that if we continue to keep our eye on the big prize, we will get there. Then some ingenuity can be a very powerful tool to gain leverage to get us to the next level. Now these are just some of the ideas that I got from our talks. Don't be afraid to live out loud and ask some silly questions. We all have access to masters and their people just like us. They have the same feelings and questions that we have. We can learn so much from our peers and fellow masters that I encourage you and please stay with us and, and we will continue to do this. So come back next time on The Real Deal On where we will find out some of the craziest things that have happened to some of our friends. Some this is not re reality. This is The Real Deal. deal. deal.